Hello and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Ocean TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. And today's our Oscar show where we're going to look at a couple headlines, like we always do, but also look at the nominations for both Best Score for the Oscars of 2014 along with the Best Song nominations. Uh, but first up, just like a year ago, there are about five film composers that the Hollywood Reporter rounded up and had sort of a sit-down talk slash interview chat with, and they made a video of it. So there's a really nice 45-minute video that you can check, and it's got uh, – we've got a link to it on our site. And this year, uh, let's see, whereas a year ago it featured uh, – let's see, you had um, Michael Dana, who eventually did win the Oscar for Life of Pi. You had um, Patrick Doyle for Brave and, and then a few others. This year, you've got uh, Alan Silvestri, uh, you've got Stephen Price, you've got Hans Zimmer, uh, Thomas Newman. So I believe Christoph Beck is in there, um, just to name a few. So you can go check the link. And, uh, well, let's see, uh, and then uh, Henry Jackman as well. Uh, but uh, the conversation is sure to be fantastic. And to see these composers all come together is a lot of fun because they all work in confinement or in solitary. So. Um, it's always fun to see them interact and to to talk about the same struggles that they all encounter. Um, also, uh, David Chen of Slash Film, who sort of does his own podcasts uh, uh, quite well, I might add, um, is a lover of music and often will do not just film podcasts, but he'll have a branch off about a composer or a certain film or a certain genre of music uh, used in film. And um, so he kind of put together his take of the best or his favorite five scores of 2013 again it's worth checking out I'm not going to name him because that would kind of spoil the whole point of his article but uh, we got a link posted at our website um and then, unfortunately there's recently been a couple of uh deaths in the film music community and kevin i was wondering if you could uh, uh enlighten us on that is that because you don't want to butcher the names of these poor people so you're leaving it up to me to butcher them well I mean, there's that. I'm going to do my but, best, but I can promise. But also, like, I tried to say goodbye to, I can't remember the the composer that died a couple years ago, and I tried to basically give a, uh, you know, like a sincere, uh, you know. Obituary? Uh, yeah, not exactly obituary, because I, it was a butchered obituary, an obituary, if you will, and it was bad. So I I've won't. sworn off wishing dead people well for the time being. At least you didn't wish any dead people well that weren't dead. That's true. I mean, I've, I've, I did that on a podcast once. That's just, that's just insulting. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know who's not dead? Mort Sabotnik. No. Nope. Oh, okay. Okay. That's true. I, now I, I learned something. Now today. you know. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> and I suppose, Dave, that is the silver lining. That's the takeaway. The silver apples of the moon lining? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you that, did. Boom. <laughs> Anyway, um, so actually a couple of European film composers are, are who we are referencing. Uh, Wojciech Kilar, and I know I probably got that name wrong. That's uh, close. Who is I, probably, to, to us Americans anyway, most famous for his score to uh, Francis Ford Coppola's um, Bram Stoker's Dracula from the mid-90s with Gary Oldman and Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder and, and others. Um, has passed away, and uh, Ritz or- Ortolani... Uh, an Italian film composer, often mentioned in the same breath as Ennio Morricone, uh, has also passed away. Um, uh, the, I think one of the other headlines for us to mention here before we get into our big Oscar list are uh, the Golden Globe Awards were on, I think, just about a week, well, last Sunday maybe, not too long ago. Um, and they're a kind of surprise winner for best score, uh, Alex Ebert's score for All is Lost, which is the Robert Redford um, film. I think – certainly not a score I'm familiar with. Bill, I don't know about you, but I think it seemed no. to be a fairly surprising choice um, because I think there were a lot of people in the same – oh, man, the same boat. Uh, us, who, uh, who I see what you did were, there. Yeah, and that was totally accidental, by the way. Um, uh, who were kind of maybe as unfamiliar uh, with the score as we were. Um, so it won a Golden Globe, which was kind of surprising, and then on top of that, uh, did not make it into the, the best score category for Oscars, um, which, again, is 
also kind of surprising considering it just won a Golden Globe a couple days ago. Uh, speaking of the best score category, Bill, why don't you take us through the nominees for that that were announced just earlier this week? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, one quick thing I want to add, um, in addition to the best original score, Golden Globe, um, the best original song was uh, Ordinary Love from the film Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom. You'll hear that one again in just a moment. But the other thing I was going to say for anyone who is curious about Volchek Kilar is, true story, he was actually hired first to score the Lord of the Rings trilogy for Peter Jackson. And I do not know all of the the comings and goings of that and what transpired, but he ended up, as we all know, not scoring that in the end. But he was the first composer chosen. And that could have been a fundamentally different film-going experience for a lot of people. Uh, anyway... Just food for thought. Um, okay, so the five Oscar nominations for Best Score for 2014 are, in no particular order, uh, John Williams for The Book Thief, Thomas Newman for Saving Mr. Banks, Philomena, or rather um, Alexander Desplat for the film Philomena, Stephen Price for Gravity, and William Butler and Owen Pallett for the film Her. Kevin, are there some Best Song nominations? Sure. Um... We've got the song uh, Alone Yet Not Alone from the film Alone Yet Not Alone by friend of the show Bruce Broughton. We'll come back to it in a second. Um, Yay, Bruce. Happy from Despicable Me 2, Let It Go from Frozen, The Moon Song from Her, and as Bill mentioned a second ago, Ordinary Love from Mandela, which just won a Golden Globe for Best Song. Um, but yeah, let's let's come back to Alone Yet Not Alone um, by Bruce Broughton, who was the first ever composer we interviewed on this um, now what three year old podcast something like that something like that yeah I predict he will win you think I, so I have no basis on that I don't know the song just full it, disclosure it's more like I predict think he's gonna win because he's a delightful person I will yeah. I will want him to win so I will want him to win as well perhaps he will get the um, the legendary streamers and punches bump we'll see that's true um, you have achieved it but it worked for Bear McCreary a couple months ago. Uh, I'm telling you, yeah. yeah. No, not a lot of people know that the Streamers and Punches bump has a very long tail. Like a, <laughs> like a three-year tail sometimes. <laughs> it, t- it takes a while to get its legs. That's true. Um, there's yeah. been a little bit of controversy around this nomination for, for Bruce. Uh, in part, well, largely due to the fact that this film uh, is... Uh, I guess very much unknown, um, even within kind of the Hollywood scene is a very low budget film. It was only screening in LA for like a week. Um, there, I guess there's been a lot of chatter, um, that there were some people who were eligible for the category for best original song who did not get nominated, who, um, we're kind of insisting that this particular film was was ineligible in part i i think that the the big rule that was cited and as silly as this sounds um there's a rule regarding how much marketing is done within the LA market while the film is being screened and that this film did not do that mm-hmm. um it's the 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 academy has said no this this song will remain in the category and and like we we've, we've said, we wish Bruce the best of luck since he was our, our very first guest. Um, Bill, you'd kind of I think said it well before the show that it sounds like there are a lot of people who are a little bit upset about this particular nomination because the film has kind of out Hollywooded Hollywood. It 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 beat Hollywood at its own game, and there are some people in more high profile films with more high profile songs that don't like that yeah and there was a a really great article or a good interview rather with david edelstein who's a film critic for uh washington post i think washington post i I was thinking new New york no you're right you're right it's not washington post that's a lady at the washington post but uh but edelstein's often interviewed on npr or he he's often there during fresh air giving his uh uh red he reads aloud his own written reviews anyway but he was interviewed for an entire show once talking about nominations and the process and sort of film criticism in general and he had a really 
profound uh, account of just what it's like these days. So when, when Kevin was describing the process by which this film, Alone Yet Not Alone, uh, sort of came onto the scene, it reminded New York me, Magazine, by the way. Um, okay, New York Magazine. It reminded me of listening to David Edelstein talk about the process, and he says, he says for film critics, you just have no idea how much uh, sort of hype and and pressure, and they're sending you stuff, and they're they're just never ending, and so it's very uh, calculated and intentional. So everyone's name that you see up there is not only is it not by accident, but it's it's by heavy heavy pressure and very organized yeah. uh, dissemination among the academy members. A, a great deal of lobbying. A great deal. Thank you. Lobbying is the best word for this because it very much is like political favoritism or in trying to encourage a vote. Yeah. And Remember, get, I think it was yeah. two or three years ago. Um, it was the year that the that Hans Zimmer, I think, was actually serving as like the music director for the Oscars that he said um, – he wasn't going to submit any of his scores uh, to be nominated because he simply didn't want to go through all the lobbying and PR stuff necessary oh, yeah. that yeah. you have to commit to, to, to kind of make a run. Yeah. It. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's interesting how that kind of thing works out. But uh, yeah. again, I think that shows that for this particular song coming from, a film who I think who I read somewhere that the, the budget for this film was like seven million dollars, so quite a small film, um, was able to to make it this far. So, yeah, well, it's it's that's, it's been sort of an interesting development. But there you go. We're pulling for him. So go Bruce, and good luck. And um, and so Kevin, do you have any predictions for the actual best score nomination? Predictions, not really. Um, or any any leanings? <laughs> any leanings? Or have you just rolled dice? And it's uh, this, yeah. I I I can't pick, say that I'm necessarily married to any of these scores. Um, if if anything, I would say, you know, Thomas Newman for saving Mr. Banks because I think he's well overdue. We kind of said that last year for his score to Skyfall, which I think I would have liked that to be a win, maybe even better. Um, Jim Lochner from FilmScoreClickTrack.com. Who we've whose uh, his blog post we've mentioned a couple of times had a, a post um, I think it was the day of the nominations or the day after the nominations and he makes a couple of really interesting points and talks about some of his predictions and some of his surprises and things like that the a couple of ones that he makes for for the best score which I tend to agree with and but I think are interesting nonetheless is that the John William nomination John Williams nomination for the book thief by this point is essentially a formality that Uh anytime when John Williams has a score that has come out in the, during the year, he will undoubtedly receive a nomination for it. Um, but because of that, like he said it, you know, kind of a snowball's chance in hell that that one's going to win. It's just, it's there almost for the formality that you have to nominate John Williams, but that's kind of it. Um, (laughs) he also, it's in his uh, contract. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will score your film and receive the necessary lobbying for an Oscar nomination. That's right. Yeah, get it. You know, contract for scoring the film, where it says you know specifically he will conduct the score during the recording session, and also will be guaranteed an Oscar nomination for said score. Yeah, that's probably how it goes. You know, there must be Uh, a, a short, brief animated segment on Family Guy that shows John Williams with the London Symphony, or maybe that was just that one time. I think it maybe it was just that one time. Although there's a reference in the in the Star Wars episode they did too, where now we're gonna have to do this whole thing with Danny Elfman. Anyway, um, oh wait, then that's two references. Yeah, that's right. There's right. two references. So yeah. uh, another thing that uh, Jim mentions that I, again I found kind of interesting is that with the Alexander Desplat nomination for um, Philomena or Philomena, I guess I'm not sure how to say it because I, I haven't seen I that movie. I think it's yet. Philomena. Okay. Um, that, that Alexander Desplat has kind of gotten to the place, not, not quite in the same position as John Williams, but has gotten to a place where he will show up quite regularly as a nominee in that category. Um, and that Thomas Newman, like I was saying, it seems like he's long overdue. Um, Jim Lochner, uh, mirrored that sentiment, but also said that he doesn't think that this is going to be it either. Um, 
in part because Saving Mr. Banks in other categories did not necessarily get the um, the recognition that people were expecting. And, and that seems to be um, something that carries weight in a category like music, that it's, n- it's mm-hmm. not necessarily the score itself that is going to determine who wins, but how much momentum there is behind that picture in general. Um, right. And so because of that, I think he, I, I don't remember exactly, kind of implied that um, Stephen Price's score to Gravity possibly has a good shot just because that film was nominated for a lot of other stuff. Yeah, I mean, I've seen Gravity, um, and I've listened to the score to The Book Thief, um, but I know that music is a big part of the film, Saving Mr. Banks, because when they address, uh, and I say this knowingly, that the, I believe it's Richard Sherman who created the music in Mary Poppins, not, well, he's, yeah, he's, he's not one, the football no, horse the shiny guy. <laughs> right, right. The, the very intelligent guy who was, of course, uh, slammed disrespectfully by um, the, Everybody. the the other guy from the other team. Anyway, and then interviewed at the worst possible time. Yeah, he could possibly be interviewed. No, not that yeah. Richard Sherman, but the one who passed away a couple years ago. No, no, uh, no, no, no. There, so there were the Sherman brothers that wrote the songs. The Sherman, um, okay, but yeah. one was Richard, right? right? One okay. of them, I don't remember. And one was, of them is still alive. I don't remember. One of them not only head. wrote Mary Poppins, but the It's a Small yeah. World. I yep, believe. and and uh, Jungle Book and oh, okay, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, I think. Okay, no, I'm sorry, not not Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. Um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. So here here's a pet theory. So Gravity is a great film, and it could get best score. Her has got all sorts of like street cred because apparently it's really well done, and Spike or Spike Jones did the good job directing, and Joaquin Phoenix is really good in it. However, I'm curious if uh, Thomas Newman could take it because it's not his best score. I've not heard anything that puts it over Shawshank Redemption, American Beauty, or Skyfall even. But yeah. as we've seen with like Denzel Washington, he never won an Oscar for his best stuff. He won it for Training Day way, way after the fact. Sure. And, and my, my hook Same on thing this, with Martin Scorsese that he oh, probably yeah. should have won for Goodfellas, but he yeah. won for The Departed. John yeah. Wayne, I think, is kind of the classical example of that. That um, oh, right. he well, won for uh, True Grit, but really he won it for his decades of playing John Wayne. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well it's said. Really what it was, yeah. But I'm That's- wondering if the nostalgia factor and the fact that it's Disney and everybody knows Disney and everyone's familiar with Mary Poppins, especially old people who occupy a large part of the Academy, yeah. will say, wait a second, I like that movie about Mary Poppins. Oh, wait, yeah. It had a couple of the old songs. I'm going to vote for best score. And yeah. Thomas Newman gets the bump from being associated with Mary Poppins, Richard Sherman, and therefore Disney, even though he is a, a great, uh, innovative, and creative and imaginative composer for film and has been for decades, yeah. since the 80s. And Maybe. Maybe. So I'll keep I my – I think it's, it's – it's, if, um, if I were to make a prediction, I would, I would probably guess that – um, although I would like to see Tom and Thomas Newman win just to win, maybe not necessarily because of this movie, but to win. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think maybe Stephen Price with his score to gravity maybe takes it again, just because there's a lot more enthusiasm behind that movie. Um, and that, that's probably one of the biggest things going against John Williams score to the book thief is that, that was literally the only category that that movie was nominated for. Ooh. It didn't perform particularly well. The yeah. reviews were really bad, so I don't think anybody really has any love for that movie that is going to translate. Into yeah, if that I had category. to, if I had to go the opposite route and pick which movie do do which score do I think will not win at all? That'd be the first one I choose. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, you're probably right. Anyway, so I mean, we will have um, we'll have a link uh, to Jim's uh, blog post on our website. You can check it out uh, for yourself to see what he has to say. It's it's a pretty insightful read. Um, as as his blog posts usually are. You can find that, of course, at soundnotion.tv slash SAP. Bill, what have you been listening to recently other than uh, perusing the list of Oscar nominees? Um, yeah, I haven't had a chance to listen to a ton. There's a bunch of films out right now. I have a longer list of what I would like to see than what I have actually seen at the moment. But I did catch uh, through renting. I did have a chance to see Zero Dark Thirty, 
with a score by, of course, Oscar nominee Alexander Desplat. Uh, uh, it was a very subdued score. You actually heard a better representation of the score in the in the menu screen for the <laughs> Blu-ray. And I could listen to it, and I'm like, oh, I hear that. I mean, that's not exactly true, but um, I was I was able to to kind of uh, kind of uh, hone in on it and and focus on it a lot more in the actual film. The movie was was really good. It was really powerful, very well put together, very dramatic. Um, of course, based on a true story, and the score was appropriately very subdued um, because of the Middle Eastern locale. A lot of drones, a lot of sort of static harmony with um, very light uh, melodic textures above. Sometimes a solo trumpet. Sometimes. Uh, I want to say like a Persian oud or, a, or a, um, some of the various, in fact, I'd say a little bit overused Middle Eastern instruments, like the ones that um, Hans Zimmer used uh, somewhat in Gladiator. And I think it's some of the same instruments that Bear McCrae used in his Battlestar Galactica episodes. It just kind of has a very dramatic sound, this um, Middle Eastern wind instrument. And the name of it does escape me at the moment. Um, it, I don't think it's a Persian neigh. But it does have a kind of um, oboe, double reed-like timbre, but it's not strictly that. Anyway, it it was there, it was there, but it was it had full, it had the correct kind of seemingly appropriate color and 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 subtle accompaniment. Um, but I did speaking of Bear McCrary, I did capture or did I talk about the uh, the the black sails main theme? Did I talk about that on our last show? Uh, I don't think so. We we talked about that. Uh, a couple months ago when we had him on the show and and it was kind of just in brief mention because it, it the the pilot has only aired recently or will air recently okay um, so when we talked to him about it i think they they maybe had recorded the pilot the score for the right. pilot but no, other than that i don't think we've mentioned it much okay i did catch that that's up you can just go youtube that uh it was really cool it's a, a lot of hurdy gurdy which is a a weird Almost awesome. like a, like a monkey grinding accordion where you twist it and turn and you get uh, speaking of drones again you get this like open fifth or perfect fifth drone which you can then play some pitches over and it's got a really rough ugly sort of dirty old raw sound to it and I if I'm not mistaken it's bear playing the hurdy gurdy during the yep. main title yep. and he's got there's you know there's a melody in there as well but the opening credits to Black Sails make it look quite a bit like yes it's going to feature pirates but it's going to be kind of like of uh of a totally different take or at least a different um kind of aesthetic than anything lately that's popular featuring pirates mm -hmm. thinking of course of the disney pirates of the caribbean series sure. or the tom hanks movie captain phillips <laughs> that's a different kind of pirate but yeah it's I different see. kind of pirates than both of those but probably more in tone or more in um, style, closer to the Disney version, but but probably uh, more like, say, the way Game of Thrones is fantasy, kind of like Lord of the Rings, but much more adult and rough and raw. And I think this positions itself to be similar to that. And yeah. the music was was kind of cool, and it was ugly, and in just the right way. So that was kind of cool. So check out the Black Sails theme from uh, Bear McCrary if you can get a chance. What have you been uh, checking out, Kevin? Um, you know, a couple of, of Blu-rays I picked up recently. One was uh, Martin Scorsese's The Departed, which I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago. Uh, has a, a score by Howard Shore, who's done the last couple of Scorsese films. Now, with with most of Scorsese's movies, uh, the I guess the recent exception is like Hugo. Um, most of his movies are are usually a combination of score and immaculately chosen source music um, because Martin Scorsese is, is in a lot of ways, a musical expert. Uh, the departed is, is no exception to that. Um, so those are always really interesting examples of fusion of, of score and source music. Um, another one is uh, an older film that I just found recently on, on Blu-ray, which is the classic Hitchcock North by Northwest featuring a score by one of the most famous Bernard Herrmann scores. And, and you might say, well, you know, why, why are you watching that, that older movie? Um, I mean, obviously it's a great movie, but why mention it now? And I mentioned it for, for uh, one reason primarily, other than the fact that it's a great movie and a really great score. Um, it's that particular Blu-ray. 
I've noticed is an example of a trend that I've seemed to notice more and more. Um, and in fact, I've picked up a couple of Blu-rays just in the past couple of weeks. North by Northwest is one. Um, Ben-Hur was another one I found. And then uh, the 1978 Superman movie. All Blu-rays released fairly recently that have uh, music-only audio tracks. An isolated score track? Yeah. just in, You can watch the movie with just the score and no other sound, which is a fantastic thing. Um, and and pr- the primary reason that I bought all of those movies on Blu-ray is because they have those features. So for the, the dozens and dozens of film executives that watch our podcast on a monthly basis, uh, right. if you keep releasing Blu-rays, uh, especially with the classic films with like really classic scores that are really, really worth studying – that have isolated music tracks, I will keep giving you my money. So um, there you have it. Yeah, keep doing that. Yeah. There you go. You get thirty bucks every time. That's right. Boom. I will promise you that I will pay the fifteen dollars for that Blu-ray if you release it with a music-only track. You will earn thirty dollars of Kevin's happiness. That's right. Every every time. All right. The gauntlet has been laid down, Blu-ray executives. It's yes. time. Go rise. Rise to the challenge. That's right. That's and you right. will make dozens and dozens of dollars. Okay. Well, um, so that's going to wrap it up. We're just going to uh, pay attention to the Oscars. Our best of luck to uh, Bruce Broughton. And for me personally, either Stephen Price or Thomas Newman, maybe slightly more Thomas Newman. But yeah. uh, good luck to all the composers and uh, especially even the ones that didn't get nominated um, and to all the songwriters as well. But uh, especially the one that has been yeah. on our show. Oh, and in yes, case that- you guys didn't say it, the Oscar ceremony, March 2nd, 2014, 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. Four Pacific. Thank you, Dave. You heard it there first. Well, Do prob- just, probably just, not first, if we're being totally honest. Yeah. <laughs> you heard right, it most so, recently there. So. Tune, in, tune in just like you, our producer. You heard it there last. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, Bill, maybe you know this. Have they, have they announced who the music director for this year's Oscar ceremonies will be? You know, I've actually been. I, kind of, I have not. I have number one. I have not heard anything. Uh, I've seen nothing on Facebook because usually I get a post at some point, yeah. or another film music or music person will comment on it. Because, for example, I know exactly who's singing the national anthem at the Super Bowl, but yeah. I don't. Can know. you believe it's Renee Fleming? Holy cow! I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, my guess, and, and I would hope, I, you know, Bill Ross has done it a lot the last couple of years and always does a great job. So yeah. not that anyone is going to listen to me about this or the Blu-ray thing. Bill Ross gets my vote to do it again. Well, maybe we should try to interview Bill Ross on a future show. Yeah, that'd be cool. Well, there you go. I mean, two I hope, bills. Who, Can't go whoever, wrong. Whoever, um, whoever is the music director for the Oscars, I, I hope that the ex- the producers of the show decide to at least – have the orchestra in the building this time and not down the road. Oh. <laughs> the yeah, Oscars and- were down the, the the orchestra was down the road last year. They weren't even in the theater. And wasn't that with uh, Seth MacFarlane where they would play Jaws music to like tell people that it's yeah. their their yeah. time is over? But but I, I say that in part because um, Bill Ross, who I just mentioned, was the the music director and the conductor. So well. Uh, Okay, I hope if Bill Ross is in charge that uh, he, yeah, that he can keep them in the building this time. Maybe they can at least have them like on the loading dock or something. So <laughs> at least, maybe even the building next door. I'll, I'll settle for that. Maybe if there's a couple extra chairs because there's some celebrity no shows. You, you know, know what they should do? They should just whenever celebrities get up to go to the bathroom, yeah. just have the orchestra members fill those seats. Yeah, the, the, so the, they can the play second. from wherever in the hall. Yeah. Where'd the second violin come from? Well, Brad Pitt had to take a dump. So I can't tell you. I can't tell you who the music director is, but I can tell you that the director of the ceremony as a whole is Hamish Hamilton, who has been directing the VMA award ceremony and was also the director of last year's Super Bowl halftime show with Beyonce. Okay. okay. So this will be Bill Ross. So somebody with some music cred. Yeah. This will be Bill Ross with lots of fireworks and. Doritos will be the sponsor, I'm sure. And, no, I'm kidding. And some well, best, sexy dancing. <laughs> well, best of luck to everyone involved, and uh, we'll be pulling for our favorites, but we'll be kind of pulling for everybody. So, right. um, uh, whoever uh, we'll look wins, forward to that. 
Whoever wins, we were rooting for you the whole time. Exactly, and we will most likely you want should, to interview them. You should totally come on the show and tell us about your wonderful Oscar night. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we do have an end towards sort of Stephen Price because we interviewed another British composer whose last name is Price. Yeah, who that actually, counts I for something, right? Basically the same person. Who actually I think is maybe related, although maybe not. But It's certainly possible. Yeah, how, how many Let's Price? just assume. It's How many not, price yeah. composers can there be coming out of England? I mean, come on. But anyway. How many <laughs> price composers that can there be that live several I thousand think we, I miles? I think this is going on a little long, guys. Okay. <laughs> I put it to our listeners. You figure that out and you email us. How many price composers are there in, in the UK? All right. That being said. Anyway. Remember to carry yeah. the three. <laughs> That'll do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. You can listen to us on soundnotion.tv slash SAP where you can subscribe to our show, leave comments, and find links to the music we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. My name is Bill Witham. And I am Kevin Wilt. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.